thanks everybody for your time today. Can we give a round of applause to those awesome performers earlier? That was a lot of fun. You know, one of the really unintended consequences of this is I didn't realize how boring I might seem after that. Because this part's just me. Someone suggested interpretive dance. That's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk to you about Victory Gardens today and what's happening now. You know, everything you saw earlier was factual. It was the actual words of the people that wrote them at the time. The characters were all the same. Original characters. The statistics are real. It can be potentially dry material, so we decided to do it this way so you can really get a feel for what people were doing in 1944, what they were saying, how they spoke, how they dressed. You know, we had the ladies baking auxiliary for victory. Those are actual recipes from the 40s that used rationed or unrationed materials. So we really wanted you to get a sense of, you know, what that time was like. So you might want to know why I'm obsessed with Victory Gardens. Why am I talking about it as if I need another obsession? Um, I have greatest generation parents, and they met when they were 13 in California at the Samuel Gompers High School in L.A. My dad got drafted in 1945 and decided to become a paratrooper because he got an extra $50 a month. They had talked about getting married, but my dad had never proposed, so my mother um, planned the wedding and sent him an invitation. <laughs> He got the invitation and said, I guess I better buy a suit. Bought a suit, showed up. They've been married for 64 years. So, yes. <laughs> They're pretty awesome people. Um, we have a family of heroes. My dad, as I said, was a paratrooper. One of my uncles was a bomber that was part of the D-Day operation. Another uncle you see in the sailor hat here. He wasn't really a sailor. He also was in the Army. He was um, being transported in the Pacific Theater and... He had dang fever, so he had to stay behind on an island, and the ship that he was supposed to be on actually got bombed and went down. So that's interesting. This uh, lady here on your right, I guess, or your left, is my Aunt Alice. She was in the waves. And that's my mother, uh, my Aunt Gloria. My mom was actually a Rosie the Riveter, so I felt a little entitled to be able to dress like this today. And then in 1946, after the war ended, uh, my parents moved to Oregon, where I'm from, and my dad learned to garden from my great-grandfather. So you see my great-grandfather, at this point, it was just a garden, but during the war, it was a victory garden. So I learned to garden from my dad, who learned to garden from my great-grandfather, who had his victory garden in 19, the 1940s. So you can see that there's a little family tradition of all this greatest generation stuff. So I love gardening. My husband and I both love gardening. Um, take the girl out of the country, but you know what they say. So we, I moved to Chicago 15 years ago, and we had, uh, my husband and I had a garden here, and then for many years we didn't, which was very upsetting. So we one day decided that we were going to buy a house. We actually decided that we were going to buy a yard with a house attached to it. <laughs> so this is a yard that only a gardener can love. We bought this yard in Budlong Woods, which is not far from this neighborhood, and the next season, we transformed it into what we like to call the Yarden. So for those of you that are familiar with our blog or our Facebook page, you hear the stories about, you know, our organic heirloom garden at 1,700 square feet, it's a spalier fruit trees, it's, it's our happy place. So happy that I spend a lot of time talking about it via the blog, via Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, and that's my happy place. So community, this is the third piece that actually brought me to this Victory Garden story. I was at my butcher one day waiting for some chicken, Muller Meats on Peterson Avenue, and I was standing there and I was looking at the wall and there's this picture of a Victory Garden on Peterson Avenue. Now the story goes that Mr. Peterson, this was his property, you see Peterson Avenue up there with the trolley or the bus or whatever it is, this was his property. You also see the big V for Victory and the flag and then all these little individual family plots. So this is um, Artesian looking to Campbell. This is Campbell Avenue. And it continued on for two more blocks. So the lady that took this picture, when she passed away, her relatives found it and gave it to the guys at the butcher shop and they have it on the wall. So that started, you know, started my hamster going on the wheel about, well, how could such an urban environment do this? And then all the Victory Garden stuff started happening and so I got intrigued so I started 
researching that. Now the problem with that is now I'm not only obsessed with my garden, but I'm also obsessed with gardens that don't even exist anymore, <laughs> which is sometimes a problem. So I want to talk to you today about the resurgence and in interest in food growing. There's a lot of factors that are making this happen. The economy, transportation, fuel issues, food safety. Food safety was the number one food story in 2009. Um, environmental concerns, people want to be more green, they want to be, eat more local, support their local environment, their local farmers, etc. There's concerns about um, gen genetically modified organisms, say that three times fast, seed diversity, loss of varieties, etc. People are wanting to be a little more self-sufficient and homegrown food tastes better. So in 2009, almost 8 million people started gardening for the first time to grow food. That's 8 million people. So in my brain, well, there's kind of a correlation there. And all these people during World War II that were experiencing diverse circumstances, they did it. Okay, now we're in different circumstances, but people are very interested in this. So how do we go about this? We don't have the Office of Civilian Defense. We don't have any overarching organization to make this happen. There is no um, governmental branch that is doing this for us. I have to say, though, that the USDA recently started a people's garden project where they are putting a food garden in every USDA facility around the world, which I think is pretty cool. So maybe they'll rise up and be the new leadership. I'm sorry this is a bad picture, but I think you can see what's going on here. You probably have to live under a rock not to know that there's a vegetable garden at the White House. And it's the first vegetable garden since Eleanor Roosevelt had one during the 40s. The organization that made that happen was originally called Eat the View, and it was a grassroots effort to get this happening on the White House lawn. Alice Waters and some other food activists had been trying to get a garden at the White House since the Clinton administration, and they just weren't able to do it. So Eat the View has now morphed into Kitchen Gardeners International, which I would you know, suggest that you take a look at. They're very much into the activism of food gardening and the um, issues around it, some of the things that I mentioned earlier. So get involved. Can I ask a question? Are, are, how many of you are gardeners? That's awesome. Yay, gardeners. How many of you wish that you were gardeners? Wow, that's even more awesome. OK, that's really great. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available for you to get involved either more as existing gardeners or for the first time as new gardeners. Uh, we talked a lot in the lecture about how the park district sort of led the charge with the Victory Garden movement. We have an excellent park district in this city. I think the reason it really succeeded during the Victory Garden movement is that less than 10 years before the war started, the Park District had taken three separate groups and made them one district. So that was less than a decade before the war started. So the organization was there, the systems were there. Also because it was the Depression, the City Park District was able to hire Harvard-educated landscape artists, horticulturalists, etc. So we had a lot of great resources. But we continue to have a lot of great, a lot of great resources today. Our Park District is the large... Do we have anybody from the Park District here today? No? Okay. So no one can hold me to my facts. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have the largest park district in the country in terms of um, participation in the number of field houses. That doesn't mean that we have the largest in terms of land. So like, for example, there's a lot of open space in Arizona, so their park district could be a lot bigger. But ours has 250 field houses and a lot of activity. We have 50 community gardens in the park district, and seven of those are vegetable gardens. Anybody that wants to grow a vegetable garden on park land can do so. There's a process involved, very similar to some of the forms that they had to fill out in the 40s, where you need to have a certain amount of people involved, you have to have a certain amount of commitment, but you, as a community, can band together and say, you know what, we want to have a vegetable garden at Wells Park. You can organize and you can do that. So if space is an issue, space is not an issue. I think that's very important. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Wicker Park Garden Club. Are any of you? Yes? OK, thanks. I met a couple of you the other night at the lecture. Thanks for coming. That's one instance where a community group has used park land and has a very robust, sort of the epicenter of the community gardening in the city of Chicago, very robust program that uses the park property. 
There are other Chicago organizations that can help you find a place to garden. One is NeighborSpace. NeighborSpace works with um, people that want to use vacant lots. So this isn't public property, this is private property. So say you live in a neighborhood.